So let us make man in our image. That's a very interesting idea. And like I said, it's not easy to understand how it was that human beings came up with the idea that us lowly creatures were... So with the Mesopotamians, for example, and the Greeks were like this too. Human beings weren't godlike. They were the playthings of the gods, right? They were, they were just... The gods just tortured us for their amusement, you know? Love and hatred and anger and all those powerful forces. We were just... We were just playthings to the gods. There wasn't anything particularly divine about us. The notion that, that in some sense we partake of the divine, is, that's a staggering idea. And you don't want to under, underestimate the difficulty that there was in abstracting that or the utility of that idea for our current mode of being. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's interesting because there is more than one creation story in Genesis. And in this story, males and females are basically created at the same time. Later, Eve is extracted out of Adam. And we'll talk about that, but not here. It's the two sexes are generated simultaneously. And they both carry within them the divine stamp, which is very egalitarian. And very appropriate, and I think unbelievably advanced. That, that's what it looks like to me. And God blessed them. Well, that's a good thing. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And there's God creating Adam and Eve. And uh, they're looking pretty happy about the whole thing. And that's Michelangelo's famous Sistine Chapel representation. And there's some cool things about this. I mean, you've got to wonder, this, this, this is an aside, and I don't know if it's a, a credible aside, but it's an interesting aside, so that's, that's a form of credible. What the hell is God doing in this thing? You know, I mean, what is this exactly? And, and so, so there's been some interesting answers to that, and this is one of them. So there was a group of scientists about 20 years ago that, that were remarked on the precise, uh, the precise analogy between this structure and the, the, the brain bisected down the middle. And of course, Michelangelo was one of the first people who did detailed um, dissections. And so um, they felt that, that, that Michelangelo had put God inside the brain for some reason. And uh, that seems to me to be associated with the notion that there's, you know, there's, a, there's an analogy or a metaphorical identity between the notion of whatever God is and the structures that give rise to consciousness. And uh, I think we really underestimate the degree to which consciousness is, is both, say, miraculous and, and not understood. I mean, you know, you, you, you have what appears to be an entirely material substrate, yet here you are, aware and self-aware and able to generate the world merely, in some sense, by looking at it. It really is remarkable, and that consciousness is dependent on, on something that wells up from deep within that material substrate that we don't understand at all. It's, it's really a, it's a crazily remarkable thing. You know, and you, you, hear, you hear a lot about scientific reductionism, but I'll tell you something that's kind of interesting, and it's, it's a tangent, too. You know, the guy that discovered DNA, I think it was Watson... And it's Watson and Crick, but I don't remember who wrote this book, but one of them, I don't remember which one, he believed that DNA was so complicated that it had to come from space. He didn't believe it could have possibly evolved on Earth. And so, like a lot of these people who are used as exemplars of scientific reductionism aren't like that at all when you actually read what they had to say, right? They, they were very aware of the limits of their own knowledge. And, I mean, DNA is something really quite spectacularly remarkable. It's an eternal substance. It's been around for a very long time. And the idea that we understand it is a very stupid idea. And I would say that, I would say that the same thing applies to the brain. Like we're, we're, we're scratching away at the surface of something we don't understand at all. And so it's quite interesting, I think. that, And maybe Michelangelo had enough gall to do that. It's certainly possible. I mean, he had enough gall to do dissections when the, when the cost of that was death. You know, he had to rob corpses, essentially, to go and do it. So he was... He wasn't, I would say, not particularly politically correct. So, <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. And there's another representation of the same thing. And that's a funny one. <laughs> I had to throw that in. I don't know how many of you know this, but there's, there's, 
there's this joke in the atheistic, atheist community, I think it might have been started by Richard Dawkins, but that might be wrong, that it was just as reasonable to believe in the flying spaghetti monster as it was to believe in God. And that's the flying spaghetti monster, by the way. And, and, uh, and so that's, <laughs> that's called touched by his noodly appendage. And uh, anyways, it's, fu it's not very sophisticated, but it is funny. If you like this video, please give this a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more content like it, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching. And have a beautiful day.